worst case that happens is you try and help people. I've had a few surgeries in my ears. We've been able to help millions of people. The biggest piece of advice that you learn on this journey so far, like in 10 years, yeah. what would that be? Hello guys, Alex Fadotov here and welcome to e-commerce scaling secrets podcast. And today I have an amazing guest here, Chad, uh, the founder of yeah. Gear and Wear uh, brand. Um, these guys do some, some very interesting products, very unique. So we'll dig deeper into, into product development side of things, uh, how you build a brand, you know, how you scale it. You also do some B2B, uh, which is, you know, interesting for, for many e-commerce entrepreneurs, especially for those that only focus on D2C side. Um, and uh, yeah, very excited for this conversation. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having us. Super excited to share a little more. Awesome. So how, how did you start this run? Like what, how, how the whole idea came to mind? Yeah, so uh, 10 years ago, I had loved ones diagnosed with cancer, getting treatment through what's called a PICC line. It's an IV tube. It goes in your arm and connects to your heart. Mm -hmm. And normally you're told to wear a sock on your arm to keep the line in place. So saw a bunch of family members and loved ones wearing socks on their arms and thought, wow, this stinks. There's got to be something better. Couldn't find anything better. And so then started working with nurses and doctors from Johns Hopkins and UVA to just redesign the sock. And kind of while I was doing that, took a step back and realized whenever you go to the hospital, everything's always been focused on function and not on how it looks or how it makes you feel. Mm -hmm. And just wanted to build a brand in the healthcare space. Interesting. What was your background before that? <clears throat> yeah, I like to tell everyone I had no value whatsoever. Uh, I'm a former Goldman uh, banker and Kearney consultant. Oh, interesting. Um, so really good at Excel and PowerPoint, but had never uh, been in the fashion or healthcare industries before. Oh, wow. But you know how to read the numbers, like how to, how to see what to focus on and... Yeah, I, I knew a lot about numbers, and then I was a patient a lot growing up. I uh, had a few surgeries in my ears, broke my bones a number of times uh, just as an uncoordinated kid, um, and so spent a lot of time in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so was, was that product, so was it kind of just like sudden, like kind of idea that, that you decided to develop that product, or it was kind of like, you know, for months you were thinking about it, like, you know, like how many people, yeah. they, they were like one day I'll start that business. And then, you know, they kind of like thinking about that for right. years, you know, how was that for you? It's actually kind of funny because uh, for years I would come up with ideas and research them nonstop and spend way too much time thinking about like, how do you create this product? How do you create this company? And for this, I came up with the idea in February, quit my job in May and starting full time and in that time, I talked to over a thousand different nurses. Um, and one of the biggest things I found is every nurse that I cold call would either answer the phone and talk to me for hours on end, mm -hmm. or they would call me back. If you've ever been in sales, you know no one ever calls that's, you back. That's um, so weird. Yeah. Right? Wow. Like, I mean, how often do you call cold call someone and they call you back? And so I saw that happening with thousands of people and was like, wow, there's something here. Interesting, but like, so you, your first step, is that kind of like some standard, like kind of like investment banking, private equity, like approach, like you, you gather market data, okay, you, you gather market kind of feedback, like, because that's unusual, like how many founders actually go and talk to potential customers, so, you know, it, it, it's kind of like not very common spread. I think it's because it's not a tech company. I think you're you're kind of talking a lot about like if you come up with a tech idea, uh -huh. a lot of founders will say, well, I've got the best tech idea. I'm going to go and create the next Facebook, the next mm -hmm. TikTok, whatever. I think for a product company, at least for, in my case, I didn't have that experience. And so I wanted to make sure that I was thinking about things that made sense. So for example, um, this is one of our pick line covers. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the sleeve that goes on your arm to kind of keep the line in place. Um, and one of the things that I didn't know is the dressing that you wear mm -hmm. over the line actually doesn't work unless you have air coming to it. And uh -huh. so when we created the first iteration of this sleeve, I created like the LeBron James um, compression sleeve, kind of like the basketball sleeve that players are wearing. Mm -hmm. And nurses immediately were like, we would never use this. And I was like, why wouldn't you use this? I thought, to your point, I think I've created a great product. And um, their big point of feedback was, 
you need breathability and visibility to the site. And so with them, we were able to kind of create this mesh window to allow for that breathability and visibility. Are you like, have you been like personally, like in kind of, you have personal expertise in product development or you had to find someone who's actually very good at it? Yeah, um, today we have a chief product officer mm -hmm. who's spent uh, over 20 years in uh, production and uh, what's it called, creating product. Um, back then, we were just really fortunate. I used an advisory board. I got in front of a lot of people um, and then found factory partners who were willing to kind of learn with us and test things out. It took us, for our first product, for this product, it took us 12 versions, iterations, before we were ready to come to market. So I think... How much time? Okay, so 12 versions. I can yeah. imagine. Okay, so you're telling them what to do. They make a sample. They send a sample. It's like a week or, you yeah. know, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, Like You review it. You give them feedback. They, they create another one. It's another word. So yeah. it's like, how, how many? How took many, a year. Yeah, took no, and um, that was, I mean, a perfect example of me not knowing anything. I think a great example, and actually a common mistake I see founders make when they're creating a product company, is you'll send to the factory and say, this is what I want. In our case, we sent one PDF, a one-page PDF of a drawing, and just had a couple of measurements. Mm -hmm. Today, we send an Excel document with probably 26 different tabs of pretty much every measurement possible that you could ever dream of, just giving really specific feedback to the factories. And I've found that to be something that's really important when you're creating a product is regardless of who the factory is, regardless of who you're partnering with, being able to give more information reduces the back and forth that you have to do. Wow, that's such a good point. Yeah, when, it, when communicating with your suppliers, it's like, oh, I want to create a product. Or like, you know, yeah. it's like, it can be very vague. Like, yeah. What kind of product? What do you want to have in it? Like, how much is, you know, target cost? Right. Like, how much it you? And so there's so many moving parts. That's yeah. such a good point, kind of just giving, giving that more thought. And so you were like, personally, kind of like, so you, you were, like mostly on the market research kind of side, like identifying that market gap? I think in the early days, uh, you're doing everything. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you're doing market research, you're doing production, uh, you're trying to sell it before it even exists. Uh, so I used to cold call hospitals every day. I think I used to call over 100 hospitals every day. Oh, wow. Um, and I wouldn't stop until I called at least 100. Um, Is it hard to deal with hospitals? I think healthcare is really slow. Um, your average sales cycle to a hospital is 12 to 18 months, if you're lucky. Um, for D2C founders, that's atrocious, right? Because your average time of sale is you put up the website and then you start to get sales. Um, so it definitely takes a lot longer. I think it's because you got to think about what the repercussions are, right? Like if you create a sock for someone uh -huh. uh, and you sell a D2C and the sock tears, the worst thing that happened is they have to get a new sock. If you create something in healthcare mm -hmm. and um, you have something really go wrong, and in our case, it does, this wouldn't really happen, knock on wood, because we're not really invasive, but if you create a product that's invasive going into the body, you could lead to an infection and potentially death. And so because of that, hospitals take a lot longer to approve items. Um, there's infection control. All of our products are antimicrobial. Uh, so we have to show them our EPA approvals for the antimicrobial treatment. It has to go through their infection control. Um, and then nurses are heavily involved as well. Um, so they have qual value analysis teams that are looking at the quality, that are looking at the product mm -hmm. and analyzing them. And we have to get approved by that as well. So let's say the process, like let's say this product as an yeah. example, right? Like you mentioned 12. Uh, 12 iterations. 12 yeah. iterations. So. After each iteration, do you send it to, to the nurses? Like, do you have some kind of like the focus group of yeah. nurses? Yeah, yeah, great question. We, uh, like in this case, we had two hospital systems that I was looking at it and then I was getting their feedback on every single one as well. Um, today, we have an advisory board of a lot of different doctors and nurses that provide feedback on every product. And then every single time that we work with a hospital system, we'll work with everyone there and be getting continual feedback as well. How did you create those relationships with like advisory boards? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's a combo of everything. A few of the people are people I'd never met that I just cold reached out to and said, hey, 
I hear that you're a good person to know. Um, my mom's an anesthesiologist, so had an unfair advantage where I knew a lot of doctors and nurses, so I was able to leverage that as well. Um, I went to undergrad at University of Virginia, so I was able to leverage those connections and get connected to the hospital and then met amazing nurses and doctors there. Um, and then it's like over the years, as we've started to get a brand and people have become aware of us, we have a lot of people reaching out to us saying, hey, we really just want to help. How can we help? Mm. And so that's been really fortunate in our case and um, really blessed to be able to work with lots of different nurses and doctors mm -hmm. on every one of our products. How, and how, how is uh, like the, the pipeline looking like for all of these products? So you have, I mean, even here, like on the table, yeah. you have like, I don't know how many SKUs is that? Like? A lot, yeah. Um, I think our ultimate goal is to be able to, um, our ultimate goal is to be able to help every single person with what they're wearing. And um, because of that, like when people ask me, what do you foresee in the future? Or what are you thinking about? I tell everyone Karen Wear is designed to help all eight plus billion people around the world with what they're wearing in and out of the hospital. Mm. So we started with cancer. Today we have products for uh, cancer treatment. Um, we have products for every single patient. We have patient gowns so that your backside's not exposed in the hospital. A couple of years ago we launched a clinical line so that we could help everyone with what they're wearing um, while they're providing care. Mm -hmm. um, today, we now actually help staff in hospitals with what they're wearing. Um, and so our ultimate goal is to help every single person. And so when you think about how do you create a pipeline, one of the big things we do is we have hospitals come to us and say, we desperately want this product. Can you work with us to create something? So oh, for example, right now we're working with MassGen, uh, a big hospital system in Boston on creating um, a next generation item that we're super excited about and working with a few other partners as well. And ultimately our goal is to help every single person. Mm. And so all of these items and new products that, that you introduce, all of them are ultimately within the apparel mm -hmm. kind of yeah, I would call it like medical apparel and accessories. Mm -hmm. So today, for example, we do a lot in linens. Um, so when you think about linen, it is what you would traditionally think of a linen, like a bed sheet, a blanket, something like that. And then we also have our patient gowns, our scrubs. We have onesies for babies in the NICU. Um, basically trying to help anything that will touch you in and out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So when you first like got into this mm -hmm. industry, like as a, you know, someone with, you know, investment banking, yeah. like a private equity experience, like did you look into the numbers, data, like analytics, is it fast growing market, compound annual growth rate, like any of those things, or it was more kind of just like a gut feeling, you know, that there is a need, there's a problem can be solved and, and the business can be built out of it. Yeah, it's a great question. I'd say when we, when we came up with the idea, I, um, I was really focused on just helping my loved ones. So uh, there were a number of other ideas and companies that I had in my head, but I did exactly what you're saying. Go out, do the market research, understand the data, everything else. In this case, it was, I was still doing that in the background, but I was really focused on how do I create a better sock um, for my friends and family that are in the hospital. And then over time, as I started to see, hey, there's something here and um, we got put on TV relatively early. Um, so actually before I even quit my full-time job, uh, Katie Couric put us on her show. And when that happened, I was kind of like, okay, there's, there's something real here. Um, and as I started to talk to my mentors, uh, their feedback was the worst case that happens is you try and help people for a year or two. Um, is that really that bad? And so today we're 10 years in and uh, we've been able to help millions of people uh, with what they're wearing. And I'd say we're just at the beginning, right? Like when you think about it, if there's over 8 billion people in the world, we're not even touching 1% of the world's population. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're excited to do a lot as much as possible for them. In terms of the B2B, right? Cause mm -hmm. your business, you mentioned right now, it's like more or less 50, 50. That's the ultimate goal. That's so the goal. yeah. yeah. And, uh, so B2B is smaller right now. Uh, B2B was smaller historically this year, B2B will be a larger portion of our business. Interesting. What are the kind of things that, 
you would let's say you learn on this mm -hmm. journey kind of like trying to grow that b2b kind of side of the business that if you would like to share let's say to yourself five years ago yeah totally i think uh a couple things one is finding the right champion in a hospital is really important um we've been really fortunate to get some pretty amazing uh ambassadors and champions of our company within various health systems uh today we work with over 90 hospital systems as a wow. vendor for them and um because we found people that really care about what we're creating, uh, that's been important. I think the second thing is you can never give up, right? Like uh, we just signed one of our biggest deals ever and it took us seven years uh, from first meeting to getting them to start using the product. And um, obviously most people would look at that timeline and be like, this isn't worth it. Um, in our case, it was a way to provide transformational change across the hospital system. And so we're, um, we're really excited at that. And then I think the third thing is kind of along those lines of never giving up is always be in touch with people, build real relationships. I'd say a lot of our hospital partners are more than just customers. Um, we have more of a friend partnership. We have uh, one hospital system whenever I go to visit them I'll actually stay at the customer's house. Um, one um, hospital system where they're reaching out every week and texting us. I think it's, you build real relationships with people. And I think one of the beauties of what we're trying to build is we're building a company to help our loved ones. And, and that in turn means we're helping your loved ones as mm -hmm. the hospital as well. And so people are behind our vision and our mission. Um, and then lastly, I think is we don't believe in a final version. Uh, I think you look at Gmail for the last, for the first 10 years it had beta in its, um, in their logo. So it would say, I don't know if you remember, it would say Gmail beta. And I'm like, look, if Google can do that for hundreds of millions of people, then we can take that same philosophy for everyone that we're serving as well. And so we're always iterating on what we're creating. So like this mesh window for example mm -hmm. a few years earlier it was darker and harder to see through and now it's much easier for nurses to be able to see that thumb from far off so that when you have this on your skin if there's any sort of leakage or infection you can see it instantaneously and it's taking that kind of feedback that you might not even notice with your naked eye yeah and incorporating that immediately wow one of the things you mentioned as well mm -hmm. like in terms of the manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, that it's not just China. It's it's uh, there's so many different countries around the world yeah. specializing in different um, different sorts of let's say if you're like in apparel business. And I see that you know I'm buying like clothing from different brands. Yeah, this one is made in Guatemala. This one is made in Cambodia. This one is made in India. This one is made in Pakistan. This one yeah. is made in Taiwan, like um, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how do you like how do you find like is there like a person that kind of like you you have like a sourcing kind of like partner that goes and investigates all of these countries all of the quotes like all of the facilities and yeah we have a product and operations team that um does a lot of that analysis so they um are talking to factories every single day we work with factories direct we work with purchasing agents like you're talking about we work with big companies small companies um, we reach out a lot is word of mouth. So working with other founders and talking to who they're manufacturing with, um, obviously having a positive reference always helps. And that's something that's really important for us. So working with people that are trusted, um, back in the early days, I actually used to do our factory visits. So did, uh, got to meet our first factory in person, met everyone that works for the factory and spent a lot of time with them. Over the years now, we have others doing that. And then we also do quality control checks. So we have a third party company um, that comes in and does both regular and randomized uh, quality control checks. And you do that just because if you tell someone, hey, I'm going to come here on Wednesday, you can pretty it up and make it way nicer. But if you just suddenly show up, um, there's a unique opportunity to see how it is in action. Um, our partners require us to have pretty stringent certifications, et cetera, like that. And that's something that's super important to us as well. So 
For example, we would never work with someone that has child labor, things like that, that are common sense. You have to your point, you have to do a lot of work to ensure that there's nothing happening in the background. And look, candidly, we probably pay a little more than we need to, but we're doing that because we want to work with the world leading factories and have the best quality uh, possible. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when it comes to cash flow, like for, for the business, like mm -hmm. two different divisions, like D2C obviously has its own kind of like limitations yeah. and challenges. And then B2B, which one is, is uh, easier to project, you know, the, the forecast for cash flow, like which one? Yeah, B2B, we tend to work on a negative networking capital basis. So what that means is we're getting cash in before we're paying for it. So, oh, you're getting prepayments. Yeah, so we're getting paid ahead of time. So that's something that's Like the super, full amount usually, or? It's... Yeah, full amount. Oh. So um, we've set it up so we have really good terms with our factories and um, we're doing a lot of B2B sales on spec. And so we'll sign a contract with a hospital. And so then to your point, we know exactly what we need to deliver when, and then we work with the factories to do that. Um, our payment terms are worst case, like net 90, net 120 per on delivery from factories. So that's another thing is, I think this helps that I don't come from this background. So when in the early days, every factory we worked with, we said, these are going to be our payment terms. Um, on the D to C basis, it's similar to what every other founder uh, that you normally interact with is dealing with is projecting properly and like being able to make sure you have the right merchandising mix and you have the right items that you're selling. Uh, D2C, we sell both on our website, on Amazon and others. And so knowing every channel, what, what to expect, what you um, can do well. We have a lot of really unique partnerships where we'll partner with other companies that want to buy our products, et cetera. Um, and so that's, again, just being- Kind powerful. of like third-party distributors? Third-party distributors, uh, wholesalers. wholesalers, we'll do, we've been in retail, um, and then we'll even do like a uh, partnership with, say for example, you are providing scrubs to your staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll work with you to be able to do that and all of that as well. So um, we basically will sell to anyone that wants to buy that has a need for our products. Interesting. So that kind of um, business model that you have in terms of the breakdown of direct to consumer and B2B, mm -hmm. is that something that you always wanted to, to, to make happen or you just like discovered like? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think from day one, I thought it was really important to have both B2B and D2C. Um, I think from a credibility standpoint, being able to go out and say, hey, we work with over 90 hospital systems, including hospital systems like the Mayo Clinic, NYU here in New York, Northwell, uh, University of Virginia, and others, really adds a lot of value, right? Um, we work with HCA, which is the world's largest hospital system. Mm -hmm. So when you go to another hospital and they ask you, have you dealt with our size and scale? We can, with a straight face, say, yes, we work with the world's largest hospital system. Um, and so I think that was really important both from a B2B perspective, but then a D2C perspective as well. And then as we were talking about how you drive awareness of your products in a hospital, having your patients and your staff wearing a company's products already and talking about how much they love it only helps the hospital say, wow, okay, we really want to wear this. And so great example is um, we've had been really fortunate to have a lot of customers be wearing our product and loving it and going to their hospitals and saying, oh my God, we need this in the hospital for every patient. And so I've really thought that that flywheel is a way to differentiate ourselves. When you look at other companies in the space, they tend to focus on one or the other. They'll only do D2C and yeah. they'll only do B2B. And I think this is a unique way to do both. And it's kind of a way to reduce your marketing expenses. Um, the one nice thing about being an investment banker is you do think about cash flow. And so we're not going to ever be the company throwing hundreds of billions of dollars on marketing, like TV ads, billboards, mm -hmm. et cetera, just for the sake of doing it. If we're going to do it, we want to make sure that the financials make sense. And so that's something um, that's super important for us. One company in your specific niche that's grown pretty like fast, like Figs, right? Mm -hmm. They only, only direct to consumer? They're only D2C, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah.
Like, do you see them as a direct competitor? Uh, I mean, look, I think there's a lot of companies out there that I'd say compete with us. So we definitely compete with them with our clinical line, but we also have a whole uh, patient line as well um, mm -hmm. that they haven't gone into. Um, and then there's other companies that only do patients and don't do clinicians. I think we're really the only company that is trying, that is not trying, that has built an all encompassing brand. So you, you're serving both sides, both serving the, the medical professionals and then the patients. Exactly. Well. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, do, do some of the, let's say hospitals ask you for specific products or generally the, the chance for new products that you have are kind of like standard the same for every every hospital yeah it's a great question um it's a little bit of both so we'll have our standard products where we'll go in and hospitals will be like oh my goodness this is amazing just uh yesterday we talked to a cno who took a lo one look at our patient count and was like oh my god this is amazing i'm sold uh let's do a follow-up immediately type of deal um but then other times they'll look to us for guidance. So they'll say, hey, what are you seeing? What could, what do you think we need help with? Um, and so a couple of products that we're working on now are items that we kind of pitched to a hospital saying, hey, what do you think about this? Do you want us to create? And they've wanted it so bad that they've said, yes, we'll co-create that with you and we'll pay you upfront for it. Um, and so that kind of tells me, hey, this is a real problem if they're willing to fork money over before it even exists. Um, and so that's been really, really important. I think the way that we really try and map out every product though is taking a three-pronged approach to product development and design, where first and foremost, always working with nurses and doctors in every product. So that's super important because that enables us to get proprietary IP on each and every one of our products. It also ensures that we're solving a true medical need. So not to harp on this again, but we're the only company that has this mesh window. Uh, there's a couple other companies that make pick line covers, but they don't have any breathability or visibility to the line. We were able to patent um, just having that breathability and visibility. Secondly is working with the end user. So um, I mentioned I went to the hospital a bunch as a kid, and I always remember being terrified of getting surgery, being even more upset because I wasn't the cool kid. All the cool kids were getting their tonsils removed. So they were going on ice cream diets for a week. I was having stuff put in my ears. So I was being asked to eat broccoli and cauliflower right after. Um, but I was most terrified because I knew everyone doing surgery on me. My mom's a doctor. So everyone involved in the surgery were people that had been to our homes numerous times. And I remember being most concerned that they were gonna see my backside in the hospital. My mom would always be like, well, you know, they've seen lots of butts in the hospital. Um, but this was a unique time where I was just like, I need to have that seven year old version of me involved in the design and development. And then lastly, we bring in a fashion and design approach. So ensuring we're using all the latest trends, technologies and designs. Uh, today we partner with brands like Oscar de la Renta. Um, we partner with the Notori company. Um, we were talking about it earlier. We even taught a class at Parsons School of Design mm -hmm. here in New York. Um, where we brought in some amazing students and designers. And our goal is, again, just trying to humanize your experience a little more. How, how important do you think is, is having, because you, you had a clear why for this business, right? It yeah. wasn't just like, you know, to, to make money, to make profit. Like yeah. it, it was, you, you had a clear why and it was your driver, you know, like throw it up and ups and downs, you yeah. know, like every business has. It was your driver. How important do you think it, it is to have like a passion for the business that you're pursuing? Um, I mean, it's a good question. I can only answer it for myself. For mm -hmm. myself, I needed it to be passion um, driven. I think growing up because you you were making good money in uh, in in that field. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you make pretty decent living yeah. doing finance and consulting. Um, but I think when you think about it, it was. Like I went to school, every activity I did has always been, how can I make the greatest impact on people? Um, I think Gandhi back in the day said, be the change that you wish to see in the world. And mm. I've definitely followed that mantra and everyone at our company follows that mantra. And so for me, it was what's gonna keep me awake at three in the morning and get me excited to solve that problem and still wake up at six in the morning ready to go. And I think that for me, it's that opportunity to transform lives and help people. And 
if I'm not going to be a nursery doctor myself, then I want to be able to help them and the patients that they're serving. Uh, and then um, probably the last one. I know you're you're a busy man, yeah. uh, and so if if you were talking right now to you know entrepreneur like watching, um, and you would um, just tell them like the biggest kind of piece of advice that you learned on this journey so far, like in 10 years, yeah. what would that be? Yeah, I mean, I think it, there's so many, so I can say a couple. Um, I think the big thing though is realizing that you're not alone and asking people for help. So um, when I started, I remember cold emailing people all the time, cold calling people, and I still do it today. I actually spend an hour a day cold calling hospitals. Oh, wow. Today? Today, yeah. Today you still yeah. spend? I think it's super important. And wow. it's, um, it's the only way to know, to your point, how do you stay abreast of what's going on in the industry? How do you know what people care about? It's talking to your customer. And so I think that's really important. I think the second thing is celebrating the wins. Mm -hmm. I've done a terrible job of this, but um me too yeah right like it's something you never do you're always like great that's awesome now i gotta do something 10 times better um and don't get me wrong we do have to do that but it's how do you celebrate what you've accomplished and i think taking a moment to really do that is important and then i think it's creating some sort of not boundary if you will but like taking the time out of your busy work schedule to cherish those around you mm -hmm. and um, being with friends, family, um, and just learning from others. I think one of our mutual friends, how we got connected, he throws events and I'll go to them, right? Like, because I want to meet other great people and I want to learn from them. And I think that's really important is surrounding yourself with great people. And um, we've been really fortunate to do that. And everyone here is, definitely not here for what we're paying them. Uh, they're, def they're here because they have a why, right? And it's what we're trying to do and how we're trying to help people. Everyone has a personal story. Uh, and I think that's pretty incredible. And um, this is just the beginning for us. Awesome. Chad, thank you so much. I've, yeah. learned, I've learned so much, you know, throughout this conversation. Um, thank you so much for watching. How people can connect with you? Yeah. Um, Come to careandwear.com. Uh, we have a contact us form. Please feel free to reach out anytime. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, follow us on social. Uh, follow us on Instagram, YouTube, obviously, um, Twitter, all that. We're at Care and Wear at everything. And if you have an idea, feel free to reach out because we're always looking uh, to learn from others and do great things together. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, Chad. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. We'll see you soon. See y'all later. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.